Hello, good evening, and welcome to the next installment of the Slack Public Lectures. Uh, for those of you who were hoping to come to a lecture in May, um, I need to apologize. We had to cancel at the last minute. Uh, the speaker had a rather severe bicycle accident, but he's up and walking now, and he's going to be hopping in November, and it'll be rescheduled for that then. And actually, the next two lectures are going to be about one of the new activities that Slack is in, the business of creating x-rays with a laser, so-called free electron laser. So in September, there'll be a talk on how we create the shortest light pulses that anyone has ever made. And in November, we'll have the talk on how you use those pulses to watch electrons zoom from one end of the other to a from one end of a molecule to the other. But today we're talking about cosmology. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Emmanuel Shan. So uh, Emmanuel has been interested in uh, the so-called cosmic microwave background, the oldest light in the universe. And he's been studying this for many years. He did his undergraduate at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. Then he came to Princeton to one of the, actually the very famous groups interested in this cosmic microwave background. He got his PhD in 2017, did a postdoc at Berkeley. Now we're lucky to have him as a staff member here at uh, KIPAC and at Slack. Um, so uh, why don't you take it away? We're going to hear about using the oldest light in the universe to learn new things about galaxies. Great. Thank you very much, Michael, for the introduction, and thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. I'm delighted to tell you about some of the research that's happening here at Slack, at Stanford, and at KIPAC, which is the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. But uh, before we get started, I was asked to say a few words about how I got interested uh, in this and my path to right here. So um, as Michael explained, I was born and grew up in France, moved to the US for a PhD to the West Coast for a postdoc, and finally here about a, a year ago um, as a staff researcher. And I've always been fascinated by physics um, because I feel like physics is real life magic. Um, there's all these incredible phenomena that occur around us every day, and there's no trick, it's actual magic. Um, put a light bulb on a battery, it turns on. Put Cheerios in a bowl, they cling to each other and to the walls of the bowl. And the more you start noticing these things and start to understand them, the more there is for you uh, to notice and understand. And so I've always wanted to know how things worked. And this is why I've been interested in, in physics. Why astrophysics in particular? Um, for me, when the time came to choose a specific topic in, in physics, when I started my PhD, I knew I wanted to do something with fundamental physics because I want to understand how things work. And it seemed like astrophysics was a good way to use the universe as a fundamental physics lab. Now, in most respects, uh, the observable universe is probably the worst fundamental physics lab you could think of um, because you don't get to touch anything. You don't get to turn knobs and rerun the experiment. All you can do is look at it. But there is one topic for which this is the very best fundamental physics lab, and that's when it comes to gravity. So some of the best evidence, and sometimes the only evidence we have for phenomena like dark energy, dark matter, the neutrinos, which I'll tell you about in a moment, uh, can be probed using the universe as a fundamental physics lab. Now, um, if you find that you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, in the area, there's many observatories and amateur astronomy clubs that you can join. Uh, we really have a ton of them here and on the East Bay that you can join. There's also a lot of events such as this one that are organized by Slack, by Stanford, and by KIPAC. And so please don't hesitate to Google. You'll find them. Um, if you find that you want to get even more involved with this kind of work, um, there's actually a lot of opportunities for education and research uh, here at Slack and at Stanford. And so I would invite you to, um, to look this up online. There's a lot of internships uh, during the year and in the summer if you want to uh, try working on some of this. And uh, finally, um, you have access to all of the state-of-the-art research in astrophysics. All of the published paper are posted and free for everyone uh, to read on these two websites which are the archive, written archive with a big X, 
and uh, NASA Astrophysics Data System. And so all of the research you're gonna hear about today is on these websites. All of that research was publicly funded um, and as a result is publicly available to everyone. So um, let's get back to our uh, topic, a cosmic shadow theater or um, how to look at galaxy shadows. Now you may not know what a galaxy uh, shadow is, but if you could just hold that galaxy between two fingers and place it in front of a light and turn the light on, uh, you might see something like this the shadow of a galaxy. And while this might seem impossible, um, these galaxy shadows are actually one of the most promising ways uh, to observe galaxies because it allows us to reveal some of their invisible properties, much like you would a watermark on a dollar bill by placing it in front of a light. So the picture I'm going to try to paint to you tonight is that of the observable universe as a cosmic shadow theater, a shadow theater in which now the galaxies are the main characters, the protagonists, and the backlight of that shadow theater is the very first light that was emitted after the Big Bang, the oldest light in the universe, uh, the so-called cosmic microwave background. So do not worry if this did not make any sense to you. I'm gonna talk about all this in more detail now, starting with the characters in our shadow theater, uh, the galaxies. And to get a sense uh, for the galaxies, it helps to start uh, right here on Earth and progressively travel far away and zoom out and look at larger and larger scales. But um, if you're lucky enough to travel to one of the national parks, um, Pinnacles, Lassen here in California, this is the kind of night sky you might be able to see. And so um, the, the specks of light you see here are mostly all stars. And this bright stripe of stars and dust that you see in the center is uh, the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is our own galaxy. Now, if you could travel away from the Earth and in fact escape the Milky Way, it would look something like this, um, a nice spiral uh, galaxy. And the sun, our star, um, is located in one of these arms. Now, there are many, many uh, stars in the Milky Way. And one number that you may want to remember by heart is this number of 100 billion stars. So the Milky Way, a typical galaxy, contains about 100 billion stars. And if you keep zooming out, you'll find that the Milky Way is not the only galaxy out there. In fact, there's, there's one that's very prominent and you can see at night with the naked eye or definitely with binoculars. And that's the Andromeda galaxy, one of our nearest neighbor. So another galaxy with again, of order 100 billion stars. And in fact, there are many, many, many more galaxies in the universe. That's the second number you may want to remember by heart. Thankfully, it's the same as the first number, so that shouldn't be too hard. 100 billion, that's the number of galaxies in the observable universe. And the way we know this is by looking at images such as this one. Uh, this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, so this is what you get when you point the Hubble Space Telescope at a patch of sky very small that you think is completely empty and you stare at this empty patch of sky for a long time, what you get is this. And here, pretty much every speck of light on this image is a galaxy. And so by extrapolating from this small patch of the sky to the whole observable universe, you get this number of about 100 billion galaxies. Okay, um, so that's the picture of our galaxies in this observable universe. An important fact to know about astronomy is that oftentimes we know the distances to these galaxies. And so while this may look like a 2D image, <laughs> it is actually a three-dimensional image of those galaxies, one that you can uh, travel through. And so you can travel through all of these galaxies in the Hubble ultra deep field. And an important fact about astronomy and I guess about life in general is that light takes time to travel. And so if I were to take a photo of you all right now, I wouldn't see you all the way you are. I would see the first row the way uh, you all were a nanosecond ago, second row two nanoseconds ago, and so on. Because here the distances are much larger, uh, we actually get to look at the evolution of the universe over uh, billions of years. And so this was not a 2D image, it was a 3D image. And really this was not a 3D image, it was a 3D uh, video of the universe. And so astronomers are not only cartographers of the universe, they're also historians. And um, thanks to this evolution of the system, we're able to observe, um, we, can, we can see what happens to all of these 100 billion galaxies in the universe. 
And as physicists, what we like to do is to um, simplify the real world into the simplest possible metaphor for it. We call that a model. And so the simplest possible uh, model that conveys most of the features of the system here would be to replace every single galaxy in the universe by just a dot with some mass. And so here we are with 100 billion uh, point masses, which feel each other's gravity. And thanks to that video of the universe we're able to observe, uh, we know how these galaxies are uh, moving. And the way they're moving can be illustrated in this way. As time goes on, um, the galaxies appear to be moving away from each other and from us. So if I play that again, galaxies appear to be moving away from each other and from us. And this is what we mean when we talk about the expansion of the universe. Um, so again, something you might want to remember by heart, if somebody asks you, what is this expansion of the universe? Just means that all the galaxies appear to be moving away from each other and away from us. Okay, so, so this is what the universe is doing right now. Um, but one question you might be interested in is what's gonna happen next? And to a physicist, this is a very familiar problem. This is a problem of point masses, which feel each other's gravity. Um, and one that we can, we know how to think about. So you have those hundred million, sorry, hundred billion balls that you are trying to juggle. And while you may not have experience uh, juggling hundred billion balls, you probably have experience juggling one ball. And if you can juggle one, 100 billion is actually not that different. And so um, I brought uh, one such ball. So think of this as a, a galaxy and the universe is expanding. This galaxy is moving uh, far away into space. And what is going to happen next? Um, there's actually two possibilities we can think of. The first one is the one you just saw. Those galaxies are moving far away into space. And when that galaxy runs away, what you see is that it slows down. It turns around. And if I let it go all the way, it collapses with the other ones. Okay, so this is outcome possible outcome number one. The expansion slows down, turns around, and collapse. It would look something like this: expansion, turn around, collapse. But there's actually a second outcome um, that's perhaps less familiar, but you may have experience with, and that's if I could throw that galaxy fast enough it wouldn't turn around and collapse on the earth. It would escape the gravity of the earth and run away forever. I'm not gonna demonstrate this, um, but one important fact is that while the galaxy would keep moving away forever, while the expansion would go on forever, that little galaxy would always be feeling the gravitational pull from the others. And so while the expansion would go on forever, it would be ever more slowly. It would be a slowed down expansion. So it would look something like this. Uh, the expansion never stops, um, but it gets ever and ever slower. So a, a less uh, crushed, less painful outcome for the future of the universe, but perhaps a more lonely one. Now, um, in those two possible scenarios that you can think of theoretically, one thing you might notice that's in common is that the expansion has to slow down. And so this is our theoretical expectation um, for the universe. The expansion uh, should be slowing down. Now, this question has actually been answered observationally, and what we see is the following. Um, and so the expansion uh, goes on, and um, this may be hard to see, but one, one obvious feature here is that it did not turn around and collapse. And if I play it again, you may be able to see that it also does not slow down, it in fact, uh, it in fact accelerates. And so observationally, what we see is this accelerated expansion of the universe. And um, if you paid attention to what I said, you might notice that it conflicts with what I told you, that the expansion uh, should be slowing down. And uh, indeed, gravity alone, as we know it, uh, cannot explain this accelerated expansion of the universe. So if you think about it, you know, if I threw this ball in the air and not only it didn't turn around, but it started moving away forever and accelerating, you would probably assume that there was some sort of little rocket hidden in the, inside that ball powering the acceleration. And so um, physicists make the same assumption and assume that therefore has to be some currently unknown source of energy responsible for powering this acceleration. And this is what we mean by dark energy. So uh, again, this is something you might wanna remember by heart. If somebody asks you, what is dark energy? Dark energy is the currently unknown source of energy. We are assuming has to be there to explain this accelerated expansion. 
Okay, um, so this is all I wanted to tell you about the protagonists and those galaxies. So again, remember this observable universe, which contains about 100 billion galaxies, like our Milky Way, each containing about 100 billion stars, uh, like, our, like our sun. The uh, universe is expanding, which is fine, but this, accelerate, this expansion is accelerating, and that's the surprising fact. And um, this cannot be explained by gravity alone. And as a result, there has to be some currently unknown source of energy to explain it, dark energy. Um, so this is a good thing to, to remember as you leave the room. Um, but um, we may, of course, you may be wondering, what is this uh, dark energy uh, beyond this definition of what it does? And so to learn about dark energy, um, astronomers are trying to measure the expansion of the universe and the clumping of matter, because both are affected by that dark energy. And so if you can me measure them at different epochs of the universe's history, it might give you clues as to how this dark energy is behaving and evolving over time. And so SLAC is involved in a number of experiments that are trying to do exactly that. Um, the first one I wanted to point out is this uh, dark energy spectroscopic instrument, DESI. Um, it's one in which SLAC is playing an important role. Um, uh, here you see the telescope in which this instrument is located uh, in Kitt Peak uh, Observatory in Arizona. So these are images I took during the commissioning of this instrument in 2020. And inside this dome uh, sits this four meter telescope. The mirror here is currently covered, but in operation, light would bounce off this mirror and be focused into this uh, black tube. And this black tube actually contains an army of 5,000 robots. Um, these are the nice kind of robots. Um, each of them is actually holding a little fiber optic that it can position so that it's looking at an individual galaxy. And so every time this telescope takes one image, it's actually observing 5,000 galaxies. And this is what you need if you want to observe a lot, a lot of galaxies real fast. And in fact, this instrument is about to give us the three-dimensional positions in space of tens of millions of galaxies. So um, it takes 5,000 uh, robots to make this happen. And it takes um, a bit fewer people, but still quite a lot uh, to make this happen. So this is an image of uh, the collaboration meeting of Daisy a few years ago on the other side of the bay uh, at Berkeley Lab. Now, another uh, very important experiment in which uh, Slack is playing a leading role is the Vera Rubin Observatory, a new observatory being built uh, as we speak in Chile. And um, uh, colleagues here at SLAC um, are working on the observatory itself, as well as the camera, uh, the new camera that will go uh, inside this observatory. The camera is actually seated uh, a few hundred meters uh, in this direction uh, in a clean room. Inside the clean room, it looks something uh, like this. And right now you are looking down the barrel at the camera sensor. And um, this camera, it turns out, is the largest digital camera um, ever built, something like 3.2 billion uh, pixels. So several hundred times more than what you get in your iPhone camera. And this is what you need if you want to observe the sky really fast um, so that you can map the positions of not tens of millions of galaxies, <clears throat> but billions of galaxies. Um, here's a view of the, galaxy, of the camera. Uh, from the side. So again, uh, not quite your, your iPhone camera. This uh, camera is going to be looking through a number of filters. And I think for me, when I saw this, it was another illustration of uh, physics is real life magic. Um, the colors of the reflection to me just look unreal. But by placing each of these filters in front of the camera, you're able to observe the colors, the different colors of galaxies, which helps you know their distances. The camera is expected to be shipped to Chile in a few months, uh, but in the meantime, it's already uh, been put to good use by taking photos of broccoli. Um, this is, I believe, the most pixels ever placed on a broccoli ever. Um, so fairly impressive. Um, but there's actually a problem. Uh, both of these experiments are looking at galaxies to see how the expansion of the universe works and how the clumping works. But when you look at galaxies um, at visual optical light, um, what you see is only the light, and the light only comes from the stars. So you are seeing all the stars, but it turns out the stars are only the very tip of the iceberg. 
So I, I told you about dark energy, um, but something else I was trying to hide from you is this dark matter, another form of matter whose presence uh, we see gravitationally, uh, but we haven't seen in any other way. So what is dark energy? What is dark matter? Perhaps two of the most important questions in all of fundamental physics. But if we focus on the ordinary matter, that of which you and I are made of, and the floor, and this table, and the laptop, the standard stuff that we know, um, only a small fraction of that ordinary matter is actually in the form of stars. And so when we look at you and I, for example, are, are not stars. Um, and so when you look at the stars and you look at the galaxies, you are really seeing about 0.5% of the total um, energy in the universe. And so you're really seeing the, the very tip of the iceberg. You're not seeing uh, the ordinary matter, which is mostly in the form of gas, it turns out. You are not seeing the dark matter. And so you're seeing a very partial picture, which makes it hard to answer the question of what is dark energy. And so it would be really great if there was a way to observe not only the stars, but all of the ordinary matter, all of the dark matter, measure its expansion, its clumping, and learn about dark energy. To give you a more visual idea of the problem here, um, remember the, the Milky Way, our own galaxy, which we talked about. And remember our neighbor, uh, the Andromeda galaxy, this little speck of white light here. If your goggles allowed you to see all of the ordinary matter in the universe, um, you would see this pink glow around it. And so what you see is that there's a lot more matter to be seen than just what's in the star. Um, and if you could see all this ordinary matter, uh, the Andromeda galaxy would not be just something you see with binoculars, it would fill 60 degrees of the sky. And so the goal here is to observe exactly uh, this ordinary matter, observe the dark matter, and to reveal them through their shadows on this backlight, um, backlight which I'm now going to tell you about. Um, so you may have heard a few times now from Michael and from me, uh, the, these words of cosmic microwave backgrounds. I'll explain in a moment uh, what that is. But to understand the cosmic microwave background, there's three important physical facts uh, you need to know about. The first one, thankfully, you already know about. It's the fact that the universe is expanding, meaning um, as time goes on, all the galaxies are moving away from each other. If you think about this, what this implies is that if I go back in time, uh, stuff is moving closer towards each other. And so um, what this expansion of the universe implies is that the early universe was a lot more dense, a lot more compressed than today's universe. Okay, so keep that in mind. This is the important physical fact number one. The physical fact number two um, is that when you compress a system, it becomes hotter. And so here what's represented is um, a visualization of what happens in a bike pump, if you want, where each of these red dots would be an air molecule. And this is a very similar system to all of our galaxies in the universe. And what temperature means for that system is just a measure of how fast these dots are moving. It turns out, as you may have experienced, when you, you pump your bike, um, the pump might get, hot, might get hot. And that's because when you compress that system, um, these particles bounce around the piston. And so they start moving faster and faster. OK, so a system that's more compressed is also hotter. And since the early universe was more compressed, the early universe had to be a lot hotter than today. OK, so that's fact number two. The early universe was more compressed and therefore hotter. Fact number three is that anything that's hot glows. And by glow, I mean emit light. Light is an electromagnetic wave, which I'm representing by this uh, wavy line here. And it's a spectrum, uh, depending on the the wavelength or the frequency of that wave. On this spectrum is a special part that's the visible part. That's what uh, you and I can see with our eyes. So it goes from red to blue, going through all of the colors of the rainbow. But this is only a very small portion of the, what I would call light, a very small portion of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. So as you go to higher energy, um, bluer than blue, you get ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray. And as you go to lower energy, redder than the reddest we're able to see with our eyes, you get um, infrared, like your TV remote, 
you get microwave, which heated my dinner tonight, and you get radio. And it turns out anything that has a temperature emits light. Um, it may not be obvious to you, but all of us in this room are emitting light. So we are all a bit warmer than uh, room temperature. And so the light that we emit is not visible. Uh, it's infrared, but you may have seen images from these infrared cameras, which reveal the light that we're all emitting right now. If we were a little bit hotter, like this piece of metal in a forge, we would start to glow uh, in the visible uh, kind of light, so red glow. And as you get hotter and hotter, like an incandescent light bulb or the sun, uh, you're glowing brighter and brighter and then into the ultraviolet, et cetera. So, um, okay, the early universe was more compressed. It was hotter. Anything that's hot glows. And so the natural conclusion from all of this is that the early universe had to glow. So what kind of lights uh, did it glow? Did it glow in the visible, in the radio, in the gamma ray? Uh, it turns out at one very crucial time in the universe's history, its temperature was uh, 3000 Kelvin. You can think of these as 3000 uh, Celsius. So about half the temperature of the surface of the sun. And so the early universe was glowing in a color a bit like this one. Um, so visible light, orange. You have to imagine the early universe being bathed in that light coming from all directions. But uh, as the universe expands um, from the Big Bang to today, what happens is that the wavelength of light also expands. And so that light, which was visible, orange, very hot, um, actually moves towards the infrared and eventually the microwave, something like three degrees above absolute um, zero. So I don't know what color to represent this because I can't see it with my eyes. It's microwave light. Um, but this is the light we expect from the Big Bang because the universe was compressed. Therefore, it had to be hot. Therefore, it had to glow. And so such a light in the microwave is expected. And in fact, it was detected in the 1960s um, with this kind of uh, microwave telescope um, in New Jersey. So um, the detection of this first light from the Big Bang is one of the strongest evidence we have for this expansion of the universe. And if somebody asks you, how is this light evidence um, for the Big Bang? Um, here's a, an analogy that I like. Uh, we've probably all taken uh, the subway or the metro, sat on a seat and found that the seat was warm. And this uncomfortable feeling you get tells you that somebody was sitting there before you, even though you cannot see them. And the cosmic microwave background, that first light from the Big Bang is exactly that. It's the leftover heat, the afterglow from the Big Bang. So um, now you might start to understand why it's called <clears throat> the cosmic microwave background. Microwave, because it's the kind of light, the kind of electromagnetic radiation we're observing. Cosmic, because it comes uh, from outer space. And uh, background, because since it comes from a very long time ago, <coughs> Uh, it appears from very far away. And so it's behind everything we see. It's a background, it's a backlight for everything in the universe. Um, a little parenthesis that's not directly relevant to the galaxy shadows we're going to talk about, but something I have to tell you uh, about the cosmic microwave background is that when you look at it, what you are seeing are the initial conditions of the universe. You're seeing at the universe the way it was uh, very shortly after the Big Bang. And so this really is the baby picture of the universe. And in fact, this patch is, just, is not just an oval patch. It's actually a map. Uh, it's the map you get if you measure the cosmic microwave background in all possible directions on the sphere and project it just like a map. And what you see is that the color is the same everywhere. Uh, the cosmic microwave background is extremely uniform. Uh, meaning the early universe was extremely homogeneous, extremely uniform. Um, and so this is the baby picture of the universe, one that's very uniform, very homogeneous. But in fact, if you look more closely at the colors in there, uh, if you stare at it for a while, uh, you might start to see all of these specks of blue and red, which indicates part of the sky that are slightly hotter or slightly colder than the, the average. This red stripe you see in the middle um, is actually not the cosmic microwave background. 
it's microwave light from the Milky Way, our own galaxy. So for the purpose of the CMB, we wish it wasn't there, but it is. But when you look away from the Milky Way, you see those um, parts of the sky that were ever slightly more dense and therefore ever slightly hotter. And in fact, these initial conditions of the universe are the seeds that uh, gave rise to the formation of all the galaxies we see to, uh, today. So the, the patches of the universe that were ever slightly hotter, ever slightly um, more dense, ended up collapsing under gravity and forming today's galaxies. Okay, um, that was probably a lot to digest. Um, there's a lot of very good YouTube videos you can watch on the topic of the cosmic microwave background. These are about 10, 10 minutes or so. So they're perfect for when you do your dishes or fold the laundry uh, and want to think about uh, the CMB. So um, to summarize, this is all I wanted to tell you about this backlight in our cosmic uh, shadow theater. So again, the universe is expanding, which means that going back in time, it was denser and therefore hotter. And everything that's hot glows. That afterglow, that leftover heat from the Big Bang, that relic radiation is what we see as the cosmic microwave background. It is evidence for the expansion of the universe, just like a warm subway seat is. And it contains the seeds for all of the galaxies that we see today. Okay, so um, putting all this together, the galaxies, the cosmic microwave background, um, here's what the observable universe looks like, starting from the sun, our star, um, as you travel out, you see um, many more stars. Um, if you remember, you see a hundred billion stars inside our galaxy, the Milky Way. And as you keep traveling out, you see um, more galaxies. Um, one, two, three, a lot more galaxies. And in fact, um, something like a hundred billion galaxies. And if you keep traveling out, if you keep zooming out, um, you will reach um, this cosmic microwave background. Um, the reason it appears like a sphere around us, it's because um, we are looking in all possible directions. So that forms a sphere around us, but nothing special about our position. And um, the sphere of the cosmic microwave background, because it's very soon after the Big Bang, is pretty much the edge of the observable universe. So um, when you hold the observable universe in your hands, uh, first, don't drop it. But all of the galaxies in the observable universe, all the stars, ours, our planet, all our friends and family, all the people we've known and loved, um, they're all inside that sphere. And so this sort of gives you a picture of what the observable universe uh, might look like. Um, another way to visualize it is with a, a timeline, with time going from the Big Bang on the left all the way to uh, today on the right. So the, the cosmic microwave background is this light uh, that's emitted soon after the Big Bang. The seeds of galaxies in the cosmic microwave background collapse under gravity, form today's galaxies. But uh, crucially for the purpose of these galaxy shadows that I wanna tell you about, for us to even see this cosmic microwave background because we're on the other side, the light from the cosmic microwave background has had to travel all the way for 14 billion years. Um, to reach us. And as you can see in this crowded picture, if you have a, a little beam of light from the CMB that's traveling across, um, it might hit one of the galaxies on the picture. And this will cause the galaxy shadows um, that I'm studying. So I've been talking about galaxy shadows. What do we mean by that exactly? Um, so here are two visible images of galaxies, little specks of light. And um, I put those two galaxies because there's two types of shadows I wanna tell you about today. Um, one is what I might call a gas shadow. Um, so this image here is actual data of the shadow of a, a galaxy like this one. And so the, the dark spot at the center um, actually tells you about all the gas, all the ordinary matter around this galaxy. And so you can see there's a lot more stuff around that galaxy that you may have suspected from just looking at that image. And there's another type of shadow, which is that, you know, if you place an image of the cosmic microwave background behind that galaxy, the mass around that galaxy, both, both ordinary mass and dark matter, 
uh, will actually deflect the light around it. This is called gravitational lensing. And so it will imprint other features on the cosmic microwave background um, that I might call mass shadow. And the nice thing about these two types of shadows is that they let you reveal both the ordinary matter and the dark matter, the two things that we want to see around these galaxies. So we're not just looking at the very tip of that iceberg. So again, uh, revealing invisible properties of the galaxies like you would watermarks on a dollar bill. Um, so these are the shadows uh, we're studying, and I thought I would just say a few more words about um, how they work. So let's start with those, those gas shadows around here. And the truth is, if you look um, at a cosmic microwave background map uh, around the position of a galaxy, so here's a, an image of a galaxy taken by Hubble in visible light, and that little galaxy actually fits within the central pixel of this very pixelated image of the cosmic microwave background. And if you stare at this uh, orange and yellow image, what you might see is nothing. Uh, there's just some weird greeniness, uh, what we call noise, something that's very familiar to uh, photographers and astrophotographers. Um, when your exposure time is just not good enough, you get all that greeniness. And so you do not see that galaxy shadow because the shadow is too faint uh, to pop out on top of that noise. And so uh, the way we actually observe those shadows is by not looking at one galaxy, but by looking at a lot of galaxies. So I told you about these experiments that are measuring the positions of millions of galaxies. And so if you extract that little map of the sky around each of, ga of the galaxies and you add them together, um, that's a process called stacking that again will be familiar for amateur astronomers. As you add more and more and more galaxies, uh, you can see that the graininess starts to disappear and this dark shadow around the center pops out. And so this is how we're detecting those gas shadows by not just looking at one object, but by looking at many, many, many objects. And again, while the stars, you know, this visible light image that you see would fit in the central pixel of that map, uh, the gas is actually a lot more extended around it. And so there's a lot more to see than you would expect from a, a beautiful Hubble image. Um, again, this should remind you of our friend, the Andromeda galaxy, and all of the gas that's very extended around it. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, what I've been calling the mass shadows, uh, or those features that um, the mass, both ordinary matter and dark matter around galaxy, imprints on the CMB. Um, to understand how it works, you have to learn a bit of general relativity, um, but uh, we still have five minutes, so that should be plenty. Um, my understanding of general relativity is fairly limited, and it's basically the following. Um, it's this quote from John Wheeler that says, uh, if you have a massive object, uh, that massive object grips space-time, telling it how to curve. So massive objects curve space-time. And the second part uh, of general relativity is that space-time grips massive objects and tell them how to move. So mass grips space-time, telling it how to curve. Space-time grips mass, telling it how to move. And so in a curved space-time around a massive object, objects don't travel in what you would think of as a straight line. Uh, rather, they travel in a straight line on that curved space, which looks like a curved line. And the important uh, result from general relativity is that this also works for light. So if light is traveling next to a massive object, the path of light will be deflected by the gravitational pull from that object. And the reason this is interesting is what happens if that massive object was dark matter and you weren't able to see it. Um, so if you're not able to see um, that massive object, you are able to infer how much mass there is from the amount of deflection you see in the light. So um, this is the effect we're after. This is how we learn about the total mass, both ordinary matter and dark matter. And to give you an idea of what it, it looks like, um, here's a, an image of the cosmic microwave background with the hot and cold spots, the parts that are slightly more dense and less dense in the cosmic microwave background. This is what that map looks like in the absence of lensing of those mass shadows. And this is what it looks like with the mass shadows. 
Um, so this one would have no mass shadows. This one would have the right amount. And by eye, those two maps might look very similar. And of course, when we look at the sky, we don't get to see both the unlensed and the lensed image, which would be really helpful. Oops. Uh, uh, which would be really helpful to extract um, the amount of lensing. Um, in fact, when you observe the sky, you're only looking at the lens image. And so from just that image, how would you know that there has been any deflection, any distortion of that image? And while this may not be obvious uh, to you by eye, those two maps are completely unmistakably different uh, from the perspective of their statistics. Um, this uh, is something you might have heard of as Gaussian statistics. Um, this one is Gaussian, this one is not. And the difference between these two maps is a, a booming signal. And the way we extract it is a, a very cute statistical method. Um, and I'm not gonna say too much more about that. But um, long story short, the result is that using those gas shadows, we're able to observe all of the ordinary matter in the universe, not just the stars. And uh, with those mass shadows, we're able to observe the dark matter. And so by having this complete picture of the matter in the universe, the ordinary matter and the dark matter, um, we are able, we are uh, going to be able to make progress on understanding dark energy and how it's affecting the expansion and the clumping. Okay, um, so uh, we I hope I've convinced you that it's useful to measure these shadows of galaxies. And uh, to measure these shadows, what we want to do is to observe the cosmic microwave background to see these shadows. And we want to observe it with uh, high resolution um, so we can see small shadows and high sensitivity such that that graininess that I showed you uh, is eliminated. And it turns out um, there are at the moment about two sites that are really the best in the world to observe the cosmic microwave background. Uh, one is in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And so I and a few others here at Slack, Kaipak and Stanford are members of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Uh, which is located at high altitude in the Atacama Desert of Chile. Um, and the reason this is such a good site to put a, a microwave telescope is because it's very high, about 5,000 meters. And as a result, it's very, very dry. And this is really important to be able to see through the atmosphere, uh, microwave light. So the Atacama Cosmology Telescope acts, uh, is hidden behind this shield that you see at the back. And so if you look over the shield, you'll see, um, you'll see the primary mirror of that telescope. Um, and um, once again, to think of designing such a telescope, to build it, to operate it, and to analyze the data uh, from it takes a village. And so um, here is a look at the ACT collaboration um, at our last meeting uh, in Princeton about a year ago. And um, ACT uh, has been there for quite a while and providing a really helpful data to allow to make some of the first detections of these shadows. Um, but now its successor is coming. So at the same site in Chile uh, will be SO, the Simons Observatory. Um, Simons Observatory will improve uh, the sensitivity of the maps we're able to make uh, by a lot. And again, a lot of people um, here at Kaipak and Stanford are involved in Simons Observatory. Uh, here's an image of the uh, collaboration taken on the other side of the bay in Berkeley a few years ago. So that's uh, one of the really amazing sites for measuring the cosmic microwave background, the Atacama Desert. Another excellent site is at the South Pole. And so uh, a number of experiments like the South Pole Telescope, SPT, and the BICEP instrument are located there. Um, again, the telescope is hidden behind this uh, wooden shield. And the reasons why the South Pole is such a good site for the cosmic microwave background is um, that it's actually really, really dry, something that may not be obvious, but it's actually a desert and extremely dry. And so again, a very good place to look at the CMB. And on top of that, the sun does not um, rise or set for about six months. And that means the temperature conditions at that site are extremely, extremely stable, uh, which is really helpful. So um, here are some of uh, our Slack colleagues uh, working on the instrumentation uh, here and uh, installing it at the at the site at Pole. 
And finally, in the next uh, few years, uh, the hope is to merge these two sites into one uh, large observatory, the Cosmic Microwave Background uh, fourth generation or stage four uh, experiments. Um, and uh, this, this collaboration, the CMBS4 collaboration, will actually be sitting in the same seats that you are uh, next week uh, to try to uh, design uh, this instrument. Um, I should probably summarize and remind you about this observable universe with 100 billion galaxies like our Milky Way, each with about 100 billion stars like our sun. Um, this expansion of the universe, would impl which implies that the early universe was uh, denser, therefore hotter, therefore luminous, uh, giving rise uh, to this cosmic microwave background light. And finally, the fact that that light has had to travel through the universe for about 14 billion years to reach us. And on its ways, uh, the ordinary matter and the dark matter have imprinted shadows on the cosmic microwave background, which allow us to reveal this ordinary matter and this dark matter and learn about uh, dark energy. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, we'll take questions now. So um, let me just say, this is being recorded. So we'd like you to wait for the microphone to come to you. I'll call on you, the microphone will come, and then ask your question. So if someone would run a microphone down to this fellow, raise your hand again. Thank you for your lecture. Um, you were talking about the expansion and slowing. Um, so you didn't mention Fritz Wiki and tired light and redshift. Mm -hmm. Is that still what people conceptualize or is there a new way to look at that? Right, yeah, so this is um, a really good question. It's the question of what exactly is this expansion of the universe? Um, I've described it as galaxies moving away from each other. Um, uh, another slightly more accurate way to describe it is uh, space expanding between galaxies. Um, but initially when this result was found that you know galaxies farther away from us appeared to be moving faster, uh, this is the famous, um, famous result by Hubble and Humison, um, there were several interpretations uh, for this. And one was uh, what you mentioned, this idea of tired light, meaning that as the light travels from these galaxies towards us, it gets tired, it interacts with matter and uh, its frequency goes towards the red, making it seem like the galaxy is moving away when it's actually not. Um, it turns out this theory of tired light um, has sort of been disproven um, because it makes different predictions from the expansion of the universe. Um, and an important one is sort of related to the size of galaxies. Um, if I'm making the universe expand and moving galaxies farther away, their apparent size will change. Whereas if there's no expansion and the light is getting tired, um, the size of galaxies does not change. And so that's what allows us to say it really is expansion and not just tired light. Thanks. Fellow who has the microphone, please go ahead. Hi. Um, question between the lensed and the unlensed depictions of CMB. Mm -hmm. And the, the conclusion is that uh, dark matter uh, is involved in this. Do you assume a distribution of dark matter in order to derive the unlensed CMB? Or do you can you glean what the distribution of dark matter is from? The difference between the lens than the unlensed CMB. That's a really good. That's a really good and important question. Um, and so, indeed, what we observe is only the lens uh, map. <clears throat> and it turns out this map alone contains in it enough information for us to extract the unlensed map and the map of the distribution of matter. And so, in fact, uh, using our statistical method from just this map. We are not assuming anything about the distribution of the matter. We are generating a map 
of where the matter is. And so that's sort of the, the beauty in this method is there's no assumptions um, on, on the matter that's causing the deflection. It's all encoded in the statistics of this field. Now well, you, you have to assume that Einstein was right about the bending mm -hmm. of light, but he was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so. Is this a lot? Okay, good. Uh, suppressing the other 13 questions that I have. Um, going, going, the observations about dark matter, dark energy, so on and so forth, do they in any way question the conservation of mass energy? Or is, or is that conservation law just a, a uh, local galactic phenomenon? Hmm. Right, so this is a question about conservation of mass, conservation of energy. Uh, and it turns out in general activity in an expanding universe, uh, these questions get somewhat uh, subtle. Um, uh, the conservation of mass and energy is not as simple as it is in a, in a static universe or uh, on small type scales like in this room. But um, there are a few interesting behaviors in terms of conservation of mass and energy for dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter appears to be behaving like normal matter, uh, meaning if I have uh, some amount of dark matter and I expand the universe, um, I still have the same amount of dark matter, just now spread out, spread over a larger volume, so diluted. Um, dark energy, on the other hand, behaves in a in a different uh, manner. And what seems to be convert, conserved for dark energy is the amount of energy per unit volume. And so that's somewhat counterintuitive because it means that if I have some amount of dark energy in this volume, uh, if I wait for a bit, the volume uh, expands by a factor of two. I have twice as much volume, uh, I'm gonna have twice as much total energy. And so dark energy is something whose amount increases as the universe is expanding. Now we know of a number of things that would behave uh, like this. Uh, and actually Michael is way more expert than I am in those things, but uh, the energy in the vacuum behaves in such a way. Um, however, the estimates we have for the amount of that energy are extremely discrepant with how much dark energy we see today. And so that's um, often what people talk about when they talk about um, the cosmological constant problem. Um, yeah. Can you go back to the summary slide real quick? Mm -hmm. For the third op for the third summary, the galaxies imprint shadows on the CMB. On the top left corner, there's a lot of like light, I guess. Mm -hmm. Where would that be coming from? Mm. Um, that's a really good question. That's something that's that's not obvious at all. So the idea, I guess, is there's different types of lights in which you can look at the universe. Um, this image on the top left is what you see when you look at the universe in visible light. I think he was talking about the yellow left hand in the Oh. On the left and the bottom. Oh, I see. Sorry. Are we talking about this? Oh, I apologize. I missed your question. Yeah, it's a really good point. So here you sort of see a shadow, and here you see maybe a slightly brighter spot and a slightly darker spot. And um, these spots that you're seeing here and there actually come from sort of two things. Uh, one part is um, other objects that are nearby that may actually be emitted, emitting in the microwave. Um, but the other big part is uh, actually what I would call noise. So fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background that are not shadows, that are just um, these primordial fluctuations. Um, thanks. Can you do that? Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Uh, could the basis of the uh, acceleration be actually residual non-uniform inflation that's still going on hmm. to give the, so to give the appearance of acceleration but we still have inflation hmm. or is that just what the expansion is hmm. that's a good question yeah so um uh, you're referring to a phase of the history of the universe that i did not describe that's called inflation inflation is what happens in the very first fraction of a second of the universe uh, and when i say fraction of a second it's often something like 10 to the minus 20 second, so a very tiny, tiny fraction of the universe in which uh, we think there was an extremely fast accelerated expansion. 
Um, and indeed, the mathematics of how you describe that accelerated expansion from inflation and from today are very, very similar. And so um, whatever form of dark energy that's causing acceleration today um, is a very similar behavior from that inflation. Um, now, is it the same thing that disappeared and reappeared? I don't know. Um, hi. hi. Um, it was a very interesting lecture. I'm from I'm Laiba and I'm from Pakistan. Um, can you tell me how the Big Bang happened? Hey, um, thanks. That's a really good. That's a really good question. Um, and. That's a, that's a hard to answer question, but a really good one, right? So we talked about this expansion of the universe, meaning things moving away from each other. And um, how if you go back in time, that means things are moving closer to each other. And actually, um, when astrophysicists talk about Big Bang, um, what they're thinking about is not really that instant zero, that perhaps that singularity where everything maybe was at the same point. We're really just thinking about anything after that, uh, where things were hot and were expanding real fast. And so um, what happened, if anything, at some sort of instant uh, zero is a good question. Um, and there's sort of two, there's, there's several scenarios that are possible, right? So if you remember the expansion of the universe, uh, if I played back in time, it looked something like this. And here it ended up in some sort of shock where everything collapsed, some sort of big bang. Um, but there's actually another uh, scenario that would look more like this, where um, what you would see instead is a bounce. And such models um, are at the moment still uh, possible. Okay, yeah. So really good question. Thank you. Right, that's a really good question. So here, those types of uh, shadows are actually from an effect called scattering. So you have that ordinary matter, that gas, and uh, that gas has electrons, which are charged particles. And when a particle of light uh, hits an electron, it gets scattered, uh, meaning it, it gets kicked out into other directions. And so that type of shadow, when you see that, is only from gas, only from ordinary matter. So that one tells you directly about ordinary matter, and, and that one is easy. Um, the other one, this one about deflection of light, um, this effect is caused by all of the matter, both the ordinary and the dark. And so if you measure only this shadow, um, you're measuring the sum of ordinary and dark matter, but you don't know how to disentangle them. And so the idea here is that by measuring these two different shadows, uh, one tells you ordinary matter, the other one tells you about ordinary plus dark matter. And so if you make the difference, you'll extract the dark matter and the ordinary matter separately. Thanks. And remarkably, it's relatively easy to see the difference because there's five times, six times as much dark matter as ordinary matter in the universe. So when you measure mass, as opposed to measure some effect that has to do with atoms, you get much larger answers. It's very surprising, but it's true. Hi, um, that was a really great lecture. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm kind of curious about, from my understanding that um, casting like light from the CMB onto galaxies is how we can tell a little bit of like what dark matter and dark energy is because of the way that it is in the shadows. But my question is, is that where we get our primary knowledge of what dark matter is or like where do we like get most of our understanding since we don't really know like where it is or what it is? Um, is, is this method like the main method or is there a different method that's like our primary way? Right, it's a really good question. So how sort of how do we know about dark matter in the first place? Is this the only way we know about it? <clears throat> and um, the answer is that there's many different ways in which we see this dark matter. And that's what makes it so hard to brush off. Um, because if you just hear about one, you're like, well, you probably messed up something, redo your calculation. But we see dark matter in many, many different ways um, from the smaller scales to the larger scales. One is if you look at how fast galaxies like our own are rotating 
and, and just stars are orbiting in that galaxy, uh, you find that they're going too fast compared to how much mass you see in the stars. And you see about too much mass by a factor of about five to one, as Michael said. So that's one clue. The other one is when you look at clusters of galaxies, so sometimes you have hundreds to thousands of galaxies that are orbiting around each other. And you look at how fast they're orbiting each other, they're orbiting too fast, which implies that there has to be more mass. And you find that there's more mass than you're seeing in the stars by a about a factor of five to one. Um, there's other um, evidence. I talked about gravitational lensing of the CMB. Um, this is actually a really powerful method, but also a young one. Um, people have been measuring gravitational lensing of galaxy images before that. And uh, again, you see too much lensing compared to what you expect by about a factor of five to one. And um, actually another uh, source of evidence for dark matter that's uh, less often quoted, but in my mind is perhaps the most powerful one is that um, when you look at the size of the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, when you look at the amplitude of those seeds and uh, you propagate them forward for 14 billion years, you don't have enough time to form any galaxies at all uh, because those seeds are too small. And so what you find is that for there to be even one galaxy in the universe, um, once we were seeing those little seeds there, there had to be hidden seeds at the same positions, but larger by about a factor of five to one. And so there's just all of these evidence for dark matter that are completely independent. And there's, there's a few other that I, I didn't mention that all point to the same amount of dark matter. Um, but yeah, all of these are useful in different ways to tell us different things about dark matter. Thanks. So we'll take a few more questions that we will cover. Thank you for the interesting uh, explanation. Uh, my question is about, um, since you always know per uh, Einstein that mass and energy can be transferred into each other in regular observable mat matter and energy. What are, have you observed any correlation between dark energy and dark matter? Could there be any quantum oscillation between these two? Or could this explain some of these seemingly unexplainable or astonishing effects that we see? That's a good question. And so um, indeed, as you're mentioning, there's an equivalence between mass and energy. And this is how we make a, a pie chart like this one. Um, uh, dark energy is an energy. The ordinary matter has a mass we can measure we can convert them into the same units of energy. And that's how we tell what fraction is ordinary dark matter or dark energy. Um, now you ask, could there be interactions between um, dark matter and dark energy, for example? Um, and that's, that's definitely a, a possibility. There are models that would allow such interactions. At the moment, we have not detected any such interaction, um, but it's worth looking for it. Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, and so that's a <clears throat> that's a good question. And again, that's a hard one to answer uh, observationally um, because uh, it's very hard to see things beyond the cosmic microwave background. Um, and part of the reason is because uh, it turns out that sphere ma marks the boundary between where the universe is transparent inside that sphere, such that we can see the cosmic microwave background. And outside that sphere, the universe um, was younger, hotter, denser, uh, to the point where it was actually opaque to light. Um, so we have some handles on what happens on the other side of that sphere, but they're somewhat limited. And um, again, if you extrapolate you know, this ex expansion backwards in time, uh, you might reach a point where everything collapsed, but there are alternatives where instead of a collapse, you would have a, a bounce. And so um, we don't really know. Make sure the mic is yeah. in. Oh. Thank you. Working? Okay, there we go. The transformation that you're using to get 
from lensed to unlensed? Is that one to one? So is there only one possible unlensed version for each lensed image? That's a that's a really really good question. So say in the lensed image, I find a hotspot here. Um, is there only one way to form a hotspot from an unlensed image and deflecting it? Um, the answer is in principle, no. Um, you could bring a hotspot from here and deflect it all the way there, um, as opposed to just moving it a little bit this way. Um, and so in principle, if you know nothing about the properties of the deflection field at all, um, and you allow the deflections to be very large, um, it would not be one-to-one. -one. However, we know that these deflections have to be small enough um, and you're not able to move things uh, this far. And so just that assumption of small deflections uh, makes it basically unique. Thank you. Okay. I think the public questions, public question time is over, but uh, Mino will be out in the lobby in just a few minutes after we clean up and uh, he'll be there. Uh, I'll be around. If you have more questions, please ask us. And if you have enjoyed this public lecture, please come back September 21st, I think, is the next date. <clears throat> Sorry? Oh, this is on. September 21st, I think, is the next date. If you'd like to sign up for our mailing list, uh, please talk to Carmen over here. Raise your hand. And she'll put you on our mailing list, and then you'll get all the announcements. So thank you very much. Thanks again to Manu for a beautiful Thank you.